Good morning, church. We join each other across the world, different devices and different times, yet we continue to be drawn by the same truth. No matter who we are, no matter where we are on life's journey, we are welcome here. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit and join me in saying the responsive call to worship. God said, let there be light. Jesus said, you are salt and light. Let us worship God who loves us just as we are.
May we be generous in our love of others as we work towards ending misunderstanding, racism, and injustice in all of its forms. Help us to create communities of human flourishing through the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns above every power and principality of any present darkness, and who sends his light to shine in each one of us. Amen. God's mercy and grace, let us together confess our sin. God of grace, you call us to generosity. You are generous towards us, yet we often hold back. You give us the gift of time to serve, learn, grow, and share, yet we often spend our time serving self. You have given us talents and abilities, yet at times we hide our gifts. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us. Remind us that you are a God of abundance and not of scarcity. Open our eyes to the possibility of full life when we give graciously and dream boldly. Amen. Let us take a moment of silence and reflect on our own lives, on our limitations, on our sins. Let us say together. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us give thanks and share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you. If you're joining us online, we invite you to share the peace in the comments. And for those of us in the sanctuary, please take a moment and greet your neighbors. Feel free to stand up, get out of your pew, and share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you. The peace of Christ be with you.
Christ and welcome to worship here at Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church. We are a diverse community where people of faith and no faith at all can come together, journey with one another, and experience the divine through openness and honesty, laughter and prayer, music and worship. Whether you're watching at home or you're here in person, it is our joy that you've decided to join us this week. And if you are a visitor, we're particularly glad that you're here. We would love to get to know you. So if you would, please take a moment and follow the Connect QR code in your bulletin. Yes, I'm giving you permission to use your phone in church. <laughs> Following worship, we invite everyone to join us for coffee hour at the lecture hall on the other side of these double doors. Next Sunday, February 12th at 1.30, LAPC will host its annual congregational meeting via Zoom. We encourage all of our members to attend this meeting and hear reports from so many of our committees and the ministries of this church, including the nominating committee, which will present its slate for the church's leadership. Members will receive the full packet and Zoom link this Thursday. Please reach out to the church office if you have any questions. Speaking of important meetings, the worship committee has been busy. You will see a few changes. There's quite a few new calls and responses. Please keep your eyes peeled for those so that I'm not just talking to myself. Now, perhaps most significantly, the worship committee has come up with a new hybrid way to take communion, which we will attempt this morning. Before anybody panics, for anybody who prefers to take communion the way that we have the last couple of years with pre-filled sets in your pews, you are absolutely welcome to continue to do that. And for anyone else who would like to take communion a bit more like we may have in the old days, I figured we should probably have a little bit of a demonstration because it's been a while. Besides, if you're like me, you might think any change in the order of worship could descend into chaos. So I've asked Susan to help. Thank you, Susan. Come over to this side. Okay, so first, anyone who would like to take communion at the table. This is a table. This is not an altar. At the table, you should come up this aisle. Susan, please show us how to walk up this aisle. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. It's going to get better. You come up this aisle, and you come right here, where Ure, our fantastic liturgist, will hand you the bread. But you're going to do this, so that Ure can place the bread in your hands. Where's our little test piece? It's gone. Oh well. I'm placing the bread in her hands, just like this. Do you have questions so far? Susan is asking, I don't know if you can hear this, but she's asking if she should rummage around in the pile of bread. No, don't do that. Go like this, Ure will place it into your hand. She will say, the bread of life, and you will say, thanks be to God. Thank you, wonderful. So then, now that you have your bread, you're gonna walk this way. I'm gonna be standing right here with the cup, and I'm gonna say, the cup of salvation. You're going to take the piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and then you eat it. Do you have questions about that? Susan's asking if she should swirl the wine around with her fingers. No, please do not put your fingers in the cup. Any other questions? She's asking if she should grab the chalice and drink out of it. No, you should not do that. After that, you can go back to your seat this way. Any questions? Thank you, Susan. We will get through this together, I promise. And now we'll have an announcement from the LAPC Voter Action Coalition. Good morning, church. My name is Tandi Shange, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the LAPC Voter Action Coalition, which is a project of the LAPC Social Justice Committee. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
As we move forward into Black History Month, I am reminded that the current wave of voter suppression tactics we are facing today is not new in our country's history. And just like in previous periods of suppression, there were countering forces from people, from the people, to secure this elemental right of citizenship. The LAPC Voter Action Coalition works in this tradition of grassroots activism, and we thank those like Fannie Lou Hamer, Bob Moses, and Ella Baker for their examples of leadership that we follow today. We are excited that our first voter registration of the voter registration drive of the year is coming up soon. It'll be on Saturday, February 25th, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., and we will be set up at the church in the Narthex and canvassing in teams in nearby um, communities. Then on February 28th, from 6.30 to 7.30, we will have an education session on ranked choice voting in the lecture hall. All city council seats will be up for election this year, and the ranked choice voting process will be used in the June primary election. This is only the second time this method has been used in the New York City elections, so please, we uh, encourage you to come join us and learn more about uh, this important change. The information in today's bulletin is for, is for your reference, and also on the banner that's newly hung on the church fence um, that was done by the Communications Committee. We thank you for that. If you're interested in volunteering with the Voter Action Coalition or participating in our events, please feel free to speak with me after church or email voteraction at lapcbrooklyn.org. We ask that you spread the word in your communities, whether through word of mouth or online. Thank you so much.
Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings. Their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady. They will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely. They have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in, or in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. The word of the Lord. Do you know that scene in Mean Girls when Amy Poehler catches her underage daughter, Rachel McAdams, of course, drinking with friends, and then says, oh, don't worry, I'm not a regular mom, I'm a cool mom. <laughs> it's great. And for me, being Presbyterian is kind of like that. I'm not a regular Christian, I'm a cool Christian, <laughs> if such a thing exists. That said, at this point, a full year of trying to convince you, plead with you all, that LAPC's Presbyterian heritage is a good thing, I thought we would go another route today, because I've spent a lot of time telling you what I like about this tradition. So today I'm going to tell you what I don't like. More specifically, I want to discuss one of our classic Presbyterian beliefs that I just don't really care for. Any guess what that might be? Close. I would love to see if somebody can come up with it, but we do have limited time. So I will just tell you, it's original sin. For those of you who don't trip over your enormous religious baggage on the way into therapy, good for you, I will tell you what this is. Original sin is basically the idea that you are born sinful. It's the idea that you came into this world without making a choice, without taking a breath, without taking a single step, and you were covered in this existential, staining dirt of sin, and you need to be made clean. Some traditions, Presbyterianism included, take this to a whole other level with the idea of total depravity. Doesn't that sound fun? <laughs> We really should get communications on board. We could get little postcards that say, come to LAPC where we celebrate original sin and total depravity. <laughs> I'm obviously joking. But I want you to think about the fact that many of the churches in this country, even in this borough, that emphasize that kind of belief, a lot of those churches draw a lot more people than we do. I think sin sells, at least in churches. In any case, since you asked, I know you didn't, but play along, I will give you three reasons why I'm not a huge fan of original sin. First, to me, it just sounds like this would mean everything is against us by default. It would make life like one of those carnival tricks where you try to toss a ball in a milk bottle, but it's been glued down. You can't win. Second, the last time I checked, Christianity is the gospel. In other words, it's supposed to be about good news, and this doesn't sound like good news to me. Third, it's just not that creative. And wouldn't you think that divine teaching in some way would be brand new information? Because the idea that we are flawed broken, no good, unworthy, sinful, these kinds of messages are not new to most of us. We've heard it all our lives, at home, at school, in the office. 
What I'm getting at is that if we are the church always, if we are the church reformed, always reforming, which is the motto of Presbyterianism, isn't it time we take another look at this idea that we're bad from the get-go? I invite you to listen now for a word from God as it echoes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. I had this one friend in seminary that any time one of us was facing a crisis or a dilemma, everybody wanted to talk to her. It wasn't because her advice was just so groundbreaking. It wasn't that she would suggest a solution you couldn't have come up with on your own. Actually, no matter the situation, no matter the problem, she always said the same thing. You're doing all the right things. That was her trademark. And it's something I think we all need to hear when times are tough. Speaking of tough times, the ancient Israelites who first encountered Matthew's account of Jesus would have been completely at a loss. I don't know if you'll remember, but they had suffered the destruction of the temple, the epicenter of their religious and cultural life. Their city, Jerusalem itself, was in ruins. The very future of their way of life was in question. In such difficult circumstances, I can only imagine the relief that Jesus intended for them in his words. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You bring flavor and brightness and goodness into this life. You're doing all the right things. Now, I usually like to save my own interpretation, a little twist, that I do my best to make every week for the end of the sermon about why this is actually such great news, but I figured we'd get right to it. The best part in what he's saying is that this isn't aspirational thinking. He's not telling them, do these things complete these service projects, follow every word of my teaching, and then you will be the salt of the earth. This is not about a future promise where one day you will be the light of the world. He's telling them who you are right now is salt, is light. Now I know that some of the more cynical New Yorkers in the room are thinking, you're telling me that I'm good the way that I am? That's really what you're going with? Some of you might be thinking that sounds like toxic positivity. <laughs> you want to know where's the challenge? Where's the opportunity for self-reflection, for improvement? If that's you, be patient. What I'm not saying is that each one of us is perfect. Neither was Jesus. And I'm definitely not saying that there's no work to be done, no growth to seek. Actually, quite the opposite. I think that most of us have a lot of growing left to do. The distinction I am trying to make, though, is that this growth is not about fundamentally changing who you are. 
It is about cultivating who you already are. This means rather than toning it down, as many of us have been told in our lives over and over, the call here is to be as salty and as bright as you possibly can be. And you may laugh, but I have to tell you, if you think that doing that in an authentic and sincere way will be easy, I completely disagree. Because to do this will be to undo years and years of trying to cram our personalities and identities into boxes. This will mean unlearning so many different ways that we have intuitively learned to hold back. The way that Jesus puts it, this means pulling up all of the various baskets we use to cover our lives. Baskets that by now probably feel pretty safe. Baskets that, at this point, probably seem good enough, comfortable enough. But the bottom line is the baskets have got to go, and this won't be easy. And to be fair, it's not like we repress ourselves without reason. I mean, as kids, somebody laughs at us for sitting by ourselves one time at lunch. And we spend the next 60 years shape-shifting our personality for everyone else so that we never have to eat alone, eat alone again. At work, we code switch. We adopt the language and the practices of whatever culture has been deemed normal in the office so that we won't stand out. So that maybe even our constant, exhausting self-editing will earn us the approval of our supervisors. I mean, I think, I think we can agree in Black History Month when we see the full challenge of a call to accept ourselves without apology and without reservation, because right now we remember both the cost of liberation and the joy of progress. I'm telling you right now that this, wo this work will not be easy, but it will be worth it. It's funny, I'm learning slowly but surely that the simplest church messages, things like, Jesus loves me, this I know, things like, we all bear the image of God, things like, we are salt and we are light, it's these deceptively simple messages that are extremely difficult to believe, to live into. So because it's my job, I've been thinking about how we might just start. What we could do to push the bar on this just even a little bit. And what I have come up with is this. Let's forget about original sin. Let's file that one away, and we tried it. Now, admittedly, I'm no theologian, so I don't really know how doctrine becomes a thing, but I am proposing that as maybe just a trial run, a new doctrine, original goodness. And if that sounds blasphemous, all I'm really suggesting is let's just see what happens if we stop assuming that we are flawed, that we start bad, that we start broken or unworthy. And instead, let's just focus on all of the salt and the light that each one of us already possesses. I wanna see what would change if we treat each other with this idea in mind. If we lived in the truth of a savior who calls us good from the get-go. Amen. I invite you to stand either in body or in spirit as together we affirm our faith using the words printed in your bulletin. We believe that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, and therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred bitterness and enmity, that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world.
good in it. Friends, the blessings of life and breath, friendship and financial resources are gifts from God. In that spirit, we thank you for your own gifts of generosity which support the ministries of Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church.
gracious God, may we give generously today, in spite of our limitations and fears, that we might offer to others our gifts with grateful hearts. Bless them and our lives to your service, that they may reveal your glory, nurture faith, and manifest justice for all your children. In Christ's name we pray. Friends, we are invited to gather around this table, regardless of how deserving we think that we are, regardless of how broken we feel, or how together our life looks to everyone else, this is God's table. And each one of us is welcome here, just as we are. All that we need is here. And in that spirit, if you prefer to take communion in your pew, using the pre-filled sets, if you still need them, please raise your hand so that a deacon may serve you. And if you're joining us online, we invite you to gather whatever your own elements may be so that we may partake of this meal together. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Up Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. We offer you praise, dear God, and hearts lifted high, for in the communion of your love, Christ comes close to us, and we come close to Christ. And so, with prayerful spirits, we give thanks for this abundance. We give thanks for the food that is before us, produced from the earth. The scriptures tell us that in the beginning, God created people in her likeness, and those creatures, those people, became many. People of many genders, races, bodies, and abilities. God created us for each other, to accompany each other, love each other, serve each other, and live together in peace. God created the world and all that is in it without borders or walls or colonies or land ownership and said that it was good. We give thanks for the goodness of creation and with our ancestors of every time and place, we join in the song of your unending greatness. that we may remember that we belong to each other and to God. 
Through this remembering, may we also proclaim that there is enough for everyone. Through this remembering, may we remember that we are stronger together, that we are called to live together with justice, to support one another, to lovingly challenge one another, and to honor the spark of the divine in one another. Amen. On the night that he was arrested by the authorities, Jesus had gathered in an upper room to celebrate the Passover story of liberation with his closest friends. He took a piece of bread, he blessed it, broke it, and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. The following supper, in the same way, he took a cup and said, this is a new covenant poured out for you, sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. So now, following Jesus' example, we take these ordinary things and we remember the bodies that continue to be broken by the powers and principalities of our time. And we also remember the new relationship to which God continually calls us, relationship where peace comes through justice. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.